Thank you very much. In the meantime, uh, uh, I'll say a word or two about Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan studied at Rutgers. Uh, he's a professor of philosophy now at the University of California, San, San Diego, and on the faculty of their interdisciplinary cognitive science program. He currently works mainly in the philosophy of perception and philosophy of language, especially those areas that interact with the cognitive sciences. Much of his recent work has developed a relationist account of color properties on which colors are co constituted in terms of a relation between objects and perceiving subjects. He has also written recently about interactions among the perceptual modalities and the implications of such interactions for such issues as perceptual architecture, synesthesia, modularity, and sensory substitution. He will talk this afternoon to us about perceptual integration, modularity, and cognitive penetration. Jonathan. Thanks, David. Uh, you get this. Some speakers were successful in talking without the microphone. Can I do that? Can you no, no. no. Okay. It was worth a shot. <laughs> okay. So um, I guess I'll just begin and hope that the lights eventually get a little brighter. Um, so the first thing to say is that I'm going to talk today about um, the joint project with Dan Bernston, um, who is, I'm proud to say, he was a graduate student in my department. He's now uh, a new assistant professor at Tulane. And so all the ideas, if there are any that, that you like, um, are due to him and all the rest are mine. So um, here's the kind of broad theme of the day. I think there there turns out to be more converging evidence, a range of different informational interactions uh, within perception of many very different kinds. The lights are halogen lights, and they are on their way to coming on. We just have to be patient. We're being patient. OK, so uh, as, I, as I was saying, there seemed, there seemed to be a range of new evidence. Um, at least it's new to me. It wasn't around when I was learning about this stuff at Zenon's knee. Um, uh, of different kinds of informational integration and perception. And so the question is, what should we think about that? In particular, what should we think uh, that that evidence tells us to conclude about questions about the modularity and cognitive penetrability of perception? <coughs> so I'm not going to walk you through the kinds of evidence I have in mind, but uh, there's kind of a list, a rough taxonomy of bullet points in uh, the first section here. Um, just lots of different kinds of evidence of different sorts of um, information integrations within perception. So there's low level stuff uh, within a modality, there's middle level stuff within, within that same modality. Within that modality, uh, namely vision, there looks like there's intrafeatural integration. So I'm here thinking, uh, for example, of in color constancy, it looks like there are different kinds of informational streams that um, are exploited to uh, arrive at a representation of one feature within one modality. Um, and then in addition, it looks like within one mode, you get lots of cases of interfeatural integration. So uh, lots of examples of that. I just want to flag, because uh, I'll mention it later, um, the case of mo apparent motion, where it looks like um, a number of people have worked on this, but in particular, Stuart Anstis has some really lovely experiments showing that there looks like there's um, computational dependence of information about luminance, contrast, and form that really uh, have systematic effects on our representation of apparent motion. In addition, there are um, intermodal cases, like for example, the big range of cross-modal illusions, um, um, sensory substitution, all kinds of stuff like that. And then there are these kind of really interesting cases where some have claimed anyway that there are emergent features that emerge from interactions in the sense that uh, there couldn't be these features represented in one modality alone. And so the, maybe the best example of that would be mint flavor. So the idea is that you can't get mint flavor just on the basis of gustatory um, input, nor can you get it just on the basis of olfactory input, nor can you get it just on the basis of oral somatosensory input. You really have to get some kind of integration going in order to represent values for that feature at all. Um, OK, so look. Um, I'm gesturing at huge numbers of studies here, and there are lots of good questions, and I haven't answered really any of them. Um, but I think collectively, it's hard to square this big range of evidence with a picture, if you ever had it, 
of perception as just a cluster of independent, mutually informationally encapsulated feature detectors uh, that just work on their own. Okay. So I take that to be sort of the state of the art, uh, crudely speaking. And so now the question is, what should we conclude on the base of that? So there is a standard reaction to hearing all that information. Um, and this standard reaction has it that if the simple non-integrative view, the one I just ridiculed, fails because of the kinds of integration I was talking about, then forget about impenetrability, forget about modularity. That's a standard reaction one sees in literature a lot. And so some representative quotations here from Butler and Hardcastle and from Prince that uh, I won't read, but you can read if you like, um, that sort of point us in that direction. But I think the standard reaction is not just a reaction that one finds um, uh, in foes of modularity, um, even friends of modularity, who, by the way, tend to be so happy with the idea that they want to go for lots of it, and so they're massive modularists. Um, they also typically accept that, uh, they, t they accept the standard reaction, namely the idea that informational integration by itself refutes modularity, and so their idea is, well, let's save modularity by replacing it with something weaker. There are lots of different ways of doing that. Um, we can talk about those later if you want. But um, Dan and I got worried about these replacement notions. I mean, one worry about the replacement notions is that often they turn out to be kind of vaguely characterized, and it's difficult to assess what they're saying, make actual predictions about cases. Um, I'm sympathetic also to the worry by another uh, Rutgers Cognitive Science student, Richard Samuels, who has argued that some of these replacement notions threaten triviality. In addition, and this one really bothers me, it seems like a lot of these replacement notions kind of give up on this very suggestive idea that I think is important that made modularity seem like it was interesting in the first place, that being modular is somehow more conducive to computational tractability. And so um, I think it would be nice to have a notion of modularity that you could, number one, reconcile with the extant evidence. That would be good. But also um, sort of save that classical idea. And so I want to ask, is the standard reaction, which I think is typically accepted by people on both sides of the issue, is that an appropriate reaction? <coughs> um, and here's a reason for thinking maybe it's not <laughs> so appropriate. Recall that. The whole notion of modularity only makes sense relative to some way of spelling out boundaries. You have to have an inside and an outside um, of a module to talk about an, an incursion across a modular boundary. Um, and so you have to figure out how you want to specify those boundaries. Now the typical, historically important way of specifying boundaries has been in terms of features. So think, oh, this, this module right here it's dedicated to the extraction of, as it might be, color. Then when the processing of color turns out to implicate information from other features, then you say, ah, oh, well, there's been a crossing of a featurally defined line. And that's a modular incursion, so give up on modularity. Um, but you don't have to think about your boundaries that way. Um, you need some way of thinking about it if you want to talk about modules, but uh, I don't think that's the only way to think about it. And so what I'd like to suggest um, is maybe a different way of thinking about modularity that defines its boundaries in a way that's compatible with featural incursions. And so this, this takes off from this idea um, that Fodor makes especially explicit in his book, The Modularity of Mind, which is that modular processes are in some way detachable. They're separable from the rest of cognition, sorry, the rest of mentation, more broadly speaking, um, in that they interact with mental processing, not in every imaginable way, but in a circumscribed number of ways. So um, the idea was that there'd be some kind of delimited range of parameters, and maybe you could even delimit it ex ante, right, before um, you look at the processing in detail, um, such that the processing would turn out to be sensitive to those parameters, but not others. Um, in a contrast case um, that's supposed to show you what modularity doesn't look like is the process of rational belief fixation. So you can think about fancy white laboratory coat 
scientists fixing their beliefs. Or you can think about just ordinary cognition. You're trying to figure out what to believe. Um, there, the, the problem is that, that the processes underlying uh, rational belief fixation are what Florida called isotropic, um, in the sense that any information, really anywhere in the cognitive system, could be potentially relevant. The oft-quoted remark is that everything the scientist knows is in principle relevant to determining what else he ought to believe. In principle, our botany constrains our astronomy. If only we could find way, sorry, if only we could think of ways to make them connect. So, um, what I want to suggest then is an anisotropy criterion for modularity. Let's say that a process is, ma is modular just in case there are bounds on both one, the tokens of the relevant mental state types that can be drawn on, and two, the ways in which the process relates those tokens. So just to begin to show that maybe this way of thinking about modularity isn't obviously wrong-headed, I want to suggest that it sustains regular verdicts, standard verdicts about uh, parade cases. So um, if you think about um, the estimation of line lengths, and here everybody's thinking about the Mueller-Liar um, illusion persisting even after you learn about the Mueller-Liar and you've measured the, the lines with your own ruler and everything like that, um, the illusion looks like it persists. The thought is that um, the output of the perceptual line length estimating process, whatever it is, looks like it's insensitive to the alteration of beliefs, indeed quite relevant <laughs> beliefs that you formed on the basis of using your ruler. Um, um, so, so that's a kind of modularity. It's a kind of insensitivity to you, you can draw a box around what parameters you have to look at ex ante. Um, whereas, in contrast, belief fixation will be non-modular. This is just exactly what was coming out of the photo quotation. Um, any belief can influence any other in potentially any way. You can't ex ante draw the box around the set of beliefs such that you only need to look at those beliefs uh, to determine whether or not you should output a given conclusion. And maybe another example that's um, um, a paradigm example would be analogical reasoning. So what makes analogical reasoning seem like it's really hard to theorize about is um, analogical reasoning looks like it's a transfer of conclusions about one domain to another domain, but you can't really know ex ante um, which considerations about domain you're going to want to transfer to domain two and which considerations about domain one you don't want to transfer over to domain two. Okay, those were paradigm cases. Now, I want to try to extend to some non-paradigm cases. Um, a first example of a non-paradigm negative case of modernity, i.e., that's not going to be a case of modernity, um, is the case of a system for action control and prospective memory. So there's um, some investigators who have proposed that there is a system for action control and perspective memory, which looks like it might be housed in dorsolateral regions of the prefrontal cortex. And what it's there for is representing higher order relations between types of perceptual information when you're doing action planning and control. So maybe this is right, maybe this is wrong. Um, what, I, what I really need is the conceptual possibility here so that I can mark out the space, the, the region of logical space. So I. I hope this example makes the point for you. If not, then I don't want what I'm saying to be held hostage to the actual facts. Um, so the, the thought is that this system, if there is a system, um, might turn out to be unrestricted in the range of perceptual parameters to which it's sensing it, to which its processing is sensitive. And why might that be a reasonable thing to think? Well, because if there is a system for action planning. Um, you, would, you might want it to be able to direct itself toward really any action, any kind of perceptual configuration. You wouldn't want it to be limited. Um, and if, if that's in fact what's going on, then the system um, is going to be such that you can't draw a box X and around the set of parameters, so it's going to be isotropic, so it's going to be non-modular. Um, that was a, supposed to be a non-paradigm negative case. Here's a non-paradigm positive case. And here's the thing about the Anstis work that I flagged before. Um, so, so Anstis has argued um, that apparent motion integrates information about contrast luminance and object information. And interestingly, the claim is, that's it. So 
Um, if that is the correct characterization of the system, then that's an amazing and interesting scientific achievement. Um, what, what the achievement is, is to have characterized the box, characterized the limit on the range of informational parameters and the ways of combining the information that you need in order to represent apparent motion in the way that we do. Um, if that can be done, then it, it would amount to a modular perceptual strategy for computing apparent motion. Whereas, to contrast it, the thought is that maybe the possibility, so maybe a modular description of action control just isn't going to be in the cards. So, um, as I say, maybe I've got the facts about these particular systems right, maybe I've got them wrong, um, but I, I want the, what I really want to emphasize is the take home lesson here is that the idea of a non-logical perceptual system, at least as I'm characterizing modularity, is utterly coherent and you shouldn't dismiss it just by stipulation or by your definition of modularity. So you may be asking yourself at this point, what does this have to do with cognitive penetration? Well, I'm glad you asked. As I read the literature, it looks like um, many people have thought that the modular non-modular distinction coincides exactly with the cognitively impenetrable, cognitively penetrable distinction, and many theorists have um, moved freely between those two distinctions because they're taking to them to be equivalent. If you construe modularity in the terms that Dan and I are suggesting, then that doesn't work. So here's a report about the literature. Here's the way that it looks like it works to me. Um, there's a conditional that is pretty widely accepted. The conditional is if you have cognitive representations, and those cognitive representations cross over a modular boundary to affect perceptual representations, that is, you've had a, an incursion across a modular line, <coughs> excuse me, then there is cognitive penetration. So that looks, as I say, to be a pretty widely accepted um, conditional. <coughs> There's dispute about the antecedent of the conditional, but lots of sides accept the conditional. So, for example, in a really influential paper about cognitive penetration, Fiona McPherson um, argues, she argues in favor of the existence of cognitive penetration, um, and her way of arguing for this is to say that she has an instance of the conditional. Right? So she says, um, there's a classificatory or categorical judgment that something is an apple, she argues that it must be a cognitive representation. Um, just very quickly, roughly, if she thinks that we couldn't have that representation just on the basis of form and color information alone. But so just grant her that grant her that it's um, that it's cognitive, it's a cognitive representation. Um, and then she looks for what she thinks are effects of that representation affecting color representation. And so she concludes, look, that's that's an instance of cognitive penetration of perception. Whereas, on the other side, people like Blishin um, try to argue away uh, putative instances of cognitive penetration by, um, well, I guess the name of the game is to argue that the putative effects of cognition are happening either before perception or after perception. So in the before stage, uh, this is the thing that that uh, this is one of the things that Brian was pointing out. Um, there are cases where the cognitive states affect the allocation of attention before perception does its work. That was the dramatic demonstration involving the closing of the eyes. Um, and then, uh, then there, there can be other cases uh, that can be explained away by um, attributing the effects of cognition to the perceptual judgment, to the post-perceptual judgment. But the strategy is to argue that because you can sort out the effect of cognition on the pre or post perceptual side that you won't then any longer have to assume that there's um, effects of cognition on perception itself. Okay. Um, well, there are different ways to come out on that dispute, but I have two worries about the way that this dispute has been pursued. Let me start with a narrow worry and then I'll move to a broader worry about it. So the narrow worry um, is that the kind of inference from classificatory or categorical to cognitive that we saw in McPherson looks to me like the bad inference. Um, and so here, just to make this point, I want to draw on 
um, some work that, again, Brian alluded to earlier that came out of his lab. Um, there are cases where you get the representation of chasing or animacy, um, and it looks like those representations depend on interesting perceptual features of the configuration. So there's movement, but also whether objects are facing in the right directions, which are hard to specify. Those are configura complex configural geometrical relations. Um, um, and their persistence, uh, chasing, and so on. I want to say that um, the representation of whether something is chasing or not, it's not any less categorical than applehood. Um, but it's possibly computed from perceptual cues, like, for example, shape, motion, and configural relations, rather than cognitive cues. Now, um, for what it's, I think that's plausible. Um, and for what it's worth, the authors of such studies themselves claim in print um, that the representations um, are defined over perceptual cues. Um, it's not at all obvious that they're wrong about that. Um, and indeed, I don't think that's an isolated case. It looks to me like there are lots of other cases where we can say that there are um, plausibly non-cognitive but classificatory processes going on that can be construed um, um, in perceptual terms, even if they're anisotropic and so modular in our sense. So um, famous cases in include things like the perception of social cues, uh, the perception of biological motion, whether a motion is biological or not, um, whether a geometric layout counts as the face of a conspecific. As I say, these are, perceptually, these are plausibly perceptually defined, not cognitively defined, even if they're categorical. Um, and they're also plausibly anisotropic, because you can define them over some finite list of perceptual cues. Um, so that's just a reason to get worried about the inference that McPherson was making from classi classificatory or categorical to cognitive. But actually, this invites us to have a, a rather broader worry, which is that it's not at all clear why cognitive processing shouldn't be thought of, at least in some cases, as being delimitable or anisotropic or modular in our sense of modular. So here's an example. It might very well turn out, some theorists have indeed held that uh, simple mental arithmetic um, is, an instance, is, a, is an example of this type of mental processing. Namely, that it draws on a delimited suite of psychological capacities. Right? You can write down the five or six that it recruits. Um, even if the capacities in that list all turn out to be conceptual or cognitive through and through. By the way, I'm here and elsewhere just assuming that you have some way of working off the cognitive from the, pen, from the perceptual. That's a good further question for all sides in this dispute. Um, so if that's the right characterization, then um, those, those cases give us uh, modularity without cognitive impenetrability. And then in the other direction, um, it looks like you can have possible isotropy, um, which is for us non-modularity, uh, without having cognitive penetration. So um, maybe the example I was giving before of perspective memory and action planning, um, um, the story there was that it might draw on a non-delimited input range, but the, that doesn't mean that the input range has to be cognitive in any way. Um, similarly, maybe <coughs> perceptual category learning. And that um, would make sense, again, for exactly the same reason. Because if, you, if there is perceptual category learning, you wouldn't want your perceptual category learning to be really super delimited in what it could pick up on. You would want it to be able to direct itself on lots of different kinds of perceptual configurations. Okay, so um, here's where I think we end up then. I want to say that the critics of modularity and impenetrability are in one way right, because there is extensive informational integration and perception. At least there's much more, there's a tidal wave of much more converging evidence of that um, now than there was, um, let's say, 15 years ago. Um, on the other hand, um, it seems to me that the critics of modularity and impenetrability are wrong about something else. Namely, they're wrong in thinking that the evidence just mentioned has to be taken as a refutation of modularity and impenetrability. Rather, what I'm trying to recommend is that maybe it would behoove us to take in the integration as motivating a quite different and uh, frankly revisionary way of thinking about modularity as based on anisotropy rather than feature boundary crossing. Um, so what are the consequences of going this way? Well, for one thing, you just get a more refined taxonomy. So 
um, you split up the modularity non modularity distinction from the cognitively penetrated, cognitively non penetrated distinction. And so you get four cells in the table, like I have there, rather than two cells in the table. Um, in addition, there are other benefits too. I think you get, you get gains of clarity, but it allows us to reconcile the importance of integration uh, within perception with the possibility of a robust notion of modularity. Um, and not just any robust notion of modularity, but I hope it's a robust notion of modularity that really attempts, anyway, to do justice to the um, um, insight I was describing before and putting in Floater's mouth that modularity goes with tractability and for that reason might actually be interesting um, for theorists um, and just invites a, a broader view of um, how we might think about ways in which mental states and perceptual states can interact with one another. So that's all I have to say by way of uh, the talk, but I just wanted to add a personal note that, like everybody else here, I'm really indebted to <coughs> Zenin. Uh, he was a really formative influence on me intellectually, and that influence has served me in extremely good stead as I've headed out into the wild blue yonder. And it's really been important to me in particular. I've ended up, as it turns out, at a university where pretty much every crazy West Coast idea uh, originated. <laughs> Um, uh, so, connectionism, and, but not just connection, uh, embodied cognition and inactive cognition, all these crazy West Coast ideas, that's, that's where I live. <laughs> it's just been super nice to have this kind of level-headed volition figure sitting on my shoulder, advising me that when I get into those discussions I should stand my ground and, um, it's, you know, we're not all crazy on the West Coast. Thanks so much. I think we have time for two or three questions. Jonathan, do you want to? Uh -huh. sure. um, I'm not quite yeah, understanding the, the category of modular cognitive penetration. So the simple arithmetic is your example. So usually people understand the modularity and cognitive penetration with regard to the issue of uh, the penetration of a perceptual module. But this seems to be a cognitive module. Do you have an example of a perceptual um, module that's cognitively penetrated? I don't offhand. I need to think about that. Fair enough. But I guess. Um, going down. On our way. I want to accept that that's a fair question to ask. I'm in no way, um, in no way trying to dodge your question. But I also want to. Um, if there was any intention to suggest that you could only ask Sorry. that question about perceptual modules, I would disagree there as well. Oh, I wasn't saying that. Okay, fair enough. The controversial issue of cognitive penetration is usually considered to be cognitive penetration of perception. Yep. Whereas what you have here is a human case of cognitive penetration. No, I, I agree. I, I agree. Um, and, I should, and let me think more and I'll try to come up with such a case. It's also my aspiration to not limit our way of asking the question to such yeah. canonical examples. Yeah, I think that the, the dialectic is, is whether there are cognitive models. Because in the original Florian sequence, he hypothesized that the distinction between modular and non modular was the distinction between perception and perception. That's what Some really good sense in which language isn't cognitive. Yes, right. Yeah. Exactly. Um, but 
but that what leads one to start asking that question. Yeah. Right? Yep, that's right. And I mean, I guess I should also say that um, Fodor's own way of developing the position involved a list of earmarks. Yeah. There are like nine or eleven earmarks of homogeneity. They're all supposed to fall together, um, which would be cool if it were true, but it's not obvious that it is true. And so, I mean, part of the thinking here with this proposal is well, maybe it would be better just to work with a simple criterion and then just see how the other criteria fall. One last question, or let us move on then. Thank Thanks. you very much.